Let me take this opportunity to welcome you to our 23rd annual West Hamer Peace Symposium. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Reynolds. It's my privilege to serve Wilmington College as its 18th president. Today's symposium is entitled Africa's Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Nonviolent Solutions. Today's presentations are designed to be a conversation about the ways that conflict and violence have been met with peaceful responses across Africa. We're really fortunate today to have a group of inspired and inspirational individuals to share their stories. We're also very proud again to offer a program that relates so directly to the mission of Wilmington College. Our Quaker heritage places peacemaking, nonviolence, and social justice at the heart of our mission. These values are fundamentally important to teaching and learning. This symposium occurs each year because of the wonderful work of Ruth Grindle, who coordinates this event. We as the committee always try to find a theme that is either something that the students can relate to personally or something that's really going to capture their imagination. And Africa is one of those places around the world that you hear about in the news, but most of us don't really know a whole lot about. So that, um, that desire to kind of educate the students more combined with the fact that there's so much happening there and the fact that we as a campus had some connections already. Um, being able to call in okay. Diane Randall and Eden Grace from yeah. Friends Committee on National Legislation and Friends United meeting, okay. giving us that Quaker connection to talking about things that are happening in Africa um, was kind of a starting point. And then looking at what are other things that students are going to be able to relate to but still have that African connection. And that's where we came up with Lisa Shannon, this idea that even though this is something happening half a world away, one person can really make a difference in a situation like that. Um, and then Chris Abani came up from a literary perspective, really, kind of giving a different experience um, as a Nigerian. What was his personal experience and how would he be able to relate that to the students? At this time, I have the pleasure of introducing Chris Abani, our first speaker. Building on his own experiences as a Nigerian who was imprisoned for his writings by his own government when he was just a teenager, Chris examines the role of art and literature in defending human rights and democracy. Chris describes himself as a zealot of optimism, and when asked in a recent interview about the things with which he is obsessed, Chris replied, I'm obsessed with the idea of how people see this world we all inhabit differently. How is it that a fixed form can yield infinite interpretation? His stories and poetry are stories of people written in a way to reflect their humanity so that they may be more human to us. Chris joins us today to help us define the intersection between social justice, art, and literature. Anyway, the story. I have to kill this goat not much bigger than a kid, a kid to kill a kid. This is the reality. It wasn't the cruelty that demanded this of me. It was simply the reality of a culture that killed its own meat, coupled with a process of masculine initiation that demanded the sacrifice of innocence as its entrance. Of course, arguably, I wasn't that innocent, having already killed chickens and turkeys, but birds are dinosaurs, and they retain their reptilian evil, and it was easy to kill reptiles. They just ask you for it. But I, but I didn't want to kill that girl. I wanted to read my new silver surfer comic in the shade of the mango tree. I wanted to hide behind the woodshed and drink Coca Colas and smoke cigarettes with my father. I wanted to do anything to kill that goat. It was a lonely walk down to the kill and stop dragging the reluctant crying kid behind me, and the rules were simple kill and dress the kid alone. But then, halfway to the river, out of the sight of the elders, a familiar figure emerged from the underbrush, my school friend and former boy soldier, Imagine. Emmanuel was what we call a hard. He had seen many terrible things taking the lives of men. Yet here he was to help me with something as ordinary as killing the goat. And as I struggled to hold the animal down, my knees pinning its leg to the ground, my hand on its horns, pulling its throat back to ready it for the bite of the knife, I froze as our eyes met and the goat cried. Tears welled and Emmanuel sensing that I was about to fail this test came over and with one hand covered the goat's eyes, and with the other closed his mouth against his own cries. Steady, he said. Such a simple gesture, pedestrian even, 
but coming from someone like him who should have cared less whether I could have killed a goat or not, meant more. I was crying louder than the goat as I pulled my knife across his throat and held his head, draining the blood into the ritual pot. And when Emmanuel let go, the goat's eyes were cloudy, and the last blood gurgled through his lips. I jumped back. Emmanuel cleaned and dressed the goat as I sat to sob him, and when he was done, he came over to me and sat down. He lit a cigarette, sucked on it and passed it to me, and said, listen, it will always be hard to kill, but if you cry every time, you will die of heartbreak. Our first afternoon presentation is from Eden Grace, Director of Global Ministries at Friends United Meeting, and Diane Randall, Executive Director of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. They will be discussing the work their respective organizations undertook together to prevent violence in Kenya in the lead up to the 2013 elections there. If you're not aware of the fact that there are more Quakers in Kenya than in the rest of the world combined, think about that. More than 50% of the Quakers in the world are Kenyan. Um, most American Quakers don't know that, and so I'm not surprised if most Wilmington to college students don't know that, but now you do know it. Um, Quakerism is an African religion. Now, Kenya is a country of 42 recognized ethnic groups or tribes. And uh, Kenya, as a peaceful and democratic country, has always recognized the right of anybody to live and work in any part of the country. And so it is uh, very ethnically mixed throughout the country. And what happened here is that if a shop was owned by a member of the tribe, of an opposing political party to the majority tribe in that location, then that shop was burned. Uh, friends began doing what they could in their own location. Um, it, uh, you can imagine that suddenly there are 50 families sleeping on the floor of your church, and they have no blankets, and they have nothing to eat. And you and your pastor and your neighbors Try to, try to meet their needs at a very local level, in every, in every village, in every place. But these stories are happening all over. I mean, as much as we hear about violence happening in countries all over the place, there are also efforts happening in local communities where people are trying to do peacemaking and violence prevention, and it's also happening on the international level. And so I think that's a story that, that we can all be involved in and, and can tell that story. So FC now as a, as, a, as a friends organization, as a Quaker organization, um, really operates from uh, those principles that I'm sure you're familiar with as friends. Uh, we, are, we believe in peace, we believe in equality, uh, we believe in simplicity, we try to operate with integrity. So FC now has, uh, if you come, some of you have been to FC now before, but if you come, you know that our vision is what we call our we seeks. We seek a world free of war and the threat of war. We seek a community where every person's potential may be fulfilled. We seek a society with equity and justice for all. And we seek an earth restored. And that's, that's our vision. Also this afternoon, the Wilmington College Chorale, under the direction of Tim Carpenter, will present a selection of pieces inspired by the people and cultures of Africa, as well as the stories of those all over the world working for a more peaceful existence.
This evening we'll be joined by Lisa Shannon, founder of Run for Congo Women. Lisa will share the stories of women facing unimaginable situations, her decision to make a difference, and the idea that it is never too late to change the world or yourself. When millions of people die and no one's even talking about it, we're sending a powerful communication that we don't consider these people human beings. And so for me, I felt like if I didn't do anything, I would be kind of joining that statement, and I felt like that was the one thing I couldn't do. <laughs> Uh, in the effort to uh, find something, some kind of, some kind of um, uh, activity that couldn't be faked, uh, I decided to run 30 miles to raise 30 sponsorships for women through Women for Women International. The next year there were 100 people, the next year there were 300, the next year 500. Several years later, at that point, thousands of people had participated in Run for Congo Women events. Um, we'd sponsored you know, more than 1,000 women. Uh, and we raised maybe about $750,000, which you will know is not a million dollars, uh, which bothered me enormously, um, but it was a movement at that point because it had sparked all kinds of grassroots activism in Congo, uh, for Congo, yoga for Congo women, swim for Congo women, bike for Congo women. Um, Eve Insler took on making her V-Day campaign uh, about Congo, really took on the issue of Congo, the Raise Up for Congo campaign, the Enough Project, so there was really a movement. And in 2009, um, as my uh, book was uh, getting ready to be released, I got a call from a producer at Oprah. And two weeks later, I was on the Oprah Winfrey Show uh, with Hillary Clinton, Ben Affleck, and Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times, and we raised $6 million in a week. So. exercise power. 